the Los Angeles Dodgers won the World Series after finishing off the Yankees in Game 5 last night. We're chatting with two front office sports reporters who looked into the political do donations of sports team owners. We're also hitting the big topics in sports media, the NFL, and NBA. It's Thursday, October 31st. Happy Halloween. I'm your ghost, Owen Poindexter, and this is Front Haunted Sports Today. Today, we're speaking with our tuned in columnist, Mike McCarthy, on his reporting about the next big NBA media target and what keeps sports media execs up at night. Our reporters, Margaret Fleming and Alex Schiffer, did some extensive reporting on the political donations of sports team owners, and they joined to explain what they found. Yahoo Sports Dan Titus joins to talk about the NBA. Plus, Netflix picked its next starting five, another young quarterback was benched, and a major sports investor may be pulling back. First, here are your top headlines. The Dodgers won their eighth World Series last night after beating the Yankees in Game 5 in New York. It was a glorious clash of the Titans for MLB, which saw a huge bounce back in viewership and huge demand for tickets. It's a series that I'm sure the league would have liked to see go longer, but with both teams shelling out more than $300 million this season in payroll, it's safe to say they will spend what they can to get back to baseball's biggest stage. On Tuesday, Better Collective, the parent company of Playmaker HQ, Action Network, and numerous other gambling-oriented outlets, laid off nearly 100 employees after downgrading its financial targets for the year. FOS senior reporter AJ Perez reached out for comments, but a spokesperson declined to say how many total layoffs there had been. CEO Jesper Sogard said on LinkedIn, As external market conditions shift, it's important for us to recalibrate our spending and investment strategies to ensure sustainable long-term success. Over to the NFL, the Wayne County Prosecutor's Office is assessing a warrant request for the arrest of Lions wide receiver Jamison Williams on a concealed weapons charge. Police found a gun under the passenger seat of Williams' car during a traffic stop, but Williams did not have a license to carry a concealed weapon. This news comes in the middle of Williams' two-game suspension for violating the NFL's PED policy. Game 3 of the World Series averaged 13.6 million viewers in the United States, making it the most-watched Monday Night World Series game since 2013. Even more notably, the World Series outdrew ESPN's Monday Night Football matchup between the Steelers and Giants by 200,000 viewers. May have taken a lackluster regular season game that happened to fall on the night of a pivotal World Series game, but for at least one day of the year, baseball was king in the U.S. Blake Griffin is in talks with Amazon and NBC to become an NBA analyst in a Charles Barkley-esque role. Griffin, who retired this year, could join Amazon Prime Video's NBA coverage as soon as next season and could be poised to become the face of Prime's coverage. FOS tuned in columnist Mike McCarthy broke the news on Griffin's future and he joins us next. I'm joined now by front office sports tuned in columnist Mike McCarthy. Welcome, Mike. Glad to be here. Great to have you on. So you broke some news uh, this week. Uh, Blake Griffin is suddenly the new target for the the NBA's new media partners. Yes, Blake has become a very, very hot free agent. Uh, after a 15-year NBA career, he called it quits uh, this April. And now, from what I'm hearing, he's talking to Amazon, possibly NBC, possibly ESPN. What you have here, Owen, is one of the first cracks in this crumbling wall, which is going to happen as these new NBA partners come in. they got to completely staff up. They don't have anybody. So, I mean, if you get a guy like uh, Blake, he's young, charismatic, Amazon can make him into their Charles Barkley and make him the face of their coverage. Also, I've been doing a lot of research on uh, Blake for this story. Apparently, he's done stand-up comedy. He's done late-night TV. He's done movies. So this guy already knows his way around Hollywood, and he already knows how to entertain an, an audience. Yeah, okay, that's it's exactly where I was going to go because, you know, sure, I could see him being, uh, you know, a very – you know, a big draw, you know, a right. big desirable analyst, but, you know, wasn't someone who I knew to have like a, a media platform already, you know, he's been in the NBA all this time. So right. uh, have we seen him, you know, show his media chops? Apparently, yes, we have. Yeah. I mean, here, here's the key. I mean, you know, you can get a million X jocks out there to talk X's and O's, but who can be funny and entertaining and spontaneous on live TV? It's a very, very rare talent. Barkley, of course, has it more than anybody else. And if you get anybody who's even like Barkley, they're going to want that person. And, you know, when you get him, I mean, not and he's sort of young for a, a media analyst, you know, young, young for this sort of thing. He's so, 35. Yeah. So, right. You could have him for a long time and maybe he doesn't command quite the, the salary that, you know, like yeah. a Barkley or a Shaq does. And the other thing, uh, Owen, about um, Blake that's very appealing, I think, to the networks and to Amazon is he's right off the court. 
I mean, every single one of these networks now wants young guys who just retired. Why? Because they know the game. They know the modern game. He just played for the world champion Celtics. So, if, you know, if you're covering a Celtic game, he could tell you about Tatum and all these guys in a way that nobody else can. Yeah. Right. Yeah. He's, he's like a, you know, a, a human like docu-series where it's yeah. like, oh yeah, I, this guy said this to me in the locker room and right. you know, whatever. Yeah. Well, this is his go-to move. Watch him, you know, do this, you know. Right. Right. He yeah. He beat like me that. on this, you know, in, yeah. in like last season. Yeah. 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 Um, yeah. Very interesting stuff. It looks like he's, he's going to end up somewhere. Um, and, you know, good opportunity for Amazon to throw its very large piles of cash around. Um, Let's hop over to baseball. So for at least one night, baseball actually was the most watched sport in America <laughs> on an NFL night. The comeback of the fall classic, you know, the grand old game stuck it to the NFL, even for one night. Game three beat Monday night football. Look, anytime, Owen, that you beat the NFL at anything, it's a cause for celebration. And I think the fact that Fox and MLB are getting 50% audience increases and 15 million viewers for this World Series has been fantastic. Here's the key. Can this thing go seven? You know, they're down three to one, the Yankees. You know, yeah, they look good last night, but networks don't root for teams. They root for length. They don't root for the Yankees. They root for Yankees Dodgers to go seven games because that's when the ad dollars really start piling in all that extra money from the extra games. So right now, if I'm Fox, I'm lighting a candle that the Yankees can make a comeback and push this to seven. Yeah. Uh, you know, it's it's funny. On one hand, yes, it's game three of the World Series or not game three game. You know, yes, game three of the World Series between the Yankees and Dodgers um versus a pretty lackluster Giants team right. um you know and the Steelers on Monday Night Football at the same time yeah like you said anytime you can beat the NFL especially when all of the NFL eyeballs are on a single game and that's not even including the Japan numbers which might double the U.S. numbers right right yeah so you know I, I think it's been an, an extraordinary postseason for Major League Baseball and a great postseason for Fox and I tell you I, you know I, I watched every second of that game last night and it was riveting TV. Big plays, the crazy nut jobs in the outfields, attacking Mookie Betts. I mean, it was it was sports, you know, Volpe sliding in, you know, to the home base. I mean, it was so exciting. And it was the kind of excitement that MLB needs a lot more of to actually compete with the NFL. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, finally, you just wrote a column, very interesting stuff on what keeps media executives up at night. And, you know, probably everyone's knee jerk response would be cord cutting. Actually, you you found something else. Yeah. I mean, when I when I found particularly when I went up to Bristol is Josh Krulowitz, who's the head of communications up there, asked Jimmy Pitaro, the chairman, what keeps you up at night? Now, we're all sitting there saying, OK, what is Pitaro going to say? He's going to say cord cutting. Right. No. He said, how do I resonate? How do I track younger viewers, particularly the kids? They don't watch sports. They may follow sports, but they don't sit down and watch a three-hour game. And that's how you monetize sports. So that could be the crack in the dam that you know undoes this whole thing. You know what I mean? If we don't get this new audience to replace the graying audience, and let's face it, sports viewers are a graying audience. They're usually in their 50s or 60s. There could be big problems down the road. Right. I mean, if you think about like, who's watching highlights, who knows what happened in the World Series game in Monday Night Football, you know, that, that's a pretty diverse set of people. If you ask who watched the second quarter of, you know, the like Bengals game on Sunday, yeah. like that's a very different audience because, you know, those are the people who just turn on the game and leave it on. To their credit, you know, the networks are trying new things. Uh, Pataro, for example, said that Pat McAfee has had a staggering impact on their ability to reach uh, younger viewers. He actually used that word staggering. He said from research that younger viewers love Pat. And then the other thing we saw this week was this kids cast out of ESPN, right? Where they're going to do the Simpsons version of a Monday night football game. I think you're going to see that more and more where you're trying to attack kids to watch the game. So they'll actually watch as well as follow. I mean, as Pataro said, on the one hand, this generation of younger people as Netflix and TikTok and all this stuff to track. But then even if they're sports fans, they might be just following it through Instagram or highlights or, you know, house of highlights or something like that. They're not watching the games. And unless we can get them to watch the games, we can't really give them the full experience and networks can't make the most money. Right. And part of the reason they love that uh, the NFL loves Amazon, the first thing that they'll say is that average audience is something like 10, 15 years younger. And, you know, that's huge for them. 
every week they repeat that same number and number <laughs> over and over. And, and Amazon is smart to do it. I mean, the NFL is tickled pink. And all the key audience demos and all the key advertising demos, Amazon Prime brings in a younger viewers in the linear networks. And that is why, you know what I mean, the NFL is going to overlook the fact that for now at least, Amazon Prime brings in a smaller uh, viewing audience because they make up for it in other ways. Yeah, very interesting stuff. Mike McCarthy, thank you so much for joining us on the show. Thank you. Netflix announced its cast for the second season of its NBA docuseries, Starting Five. The next lineup is Kevin Durant, James Harden, Shai Gilgis Alexander, Tyus Halliburton, and Jalen Brown. We've seen different formulas when it comes to athlete focused docuseries. Quarterback went with the biggest star, Patrick Mahomes, a mid tier quarterback, and Kirk Cousins, and someone barely hanging on to his job, Marcus Mariota. The tennis series, Breakpoint, mostly aimed high, but also mixed in some lesser known names. The same was true of the golf series, Full Swing. Starting Five is clearly getting the biggest stars they can find. The first season's cast is LeBron, Jason Tatum, DeMontis Sabonis, Jimmy Butler, and Anthony Edwards. Both that group and this next one would be the best starting five in the NBA if they're all on a team together. Drive to Survive was incredibly successful in introducing people to athletes they had never heard of. That can work, but if you can get the permission, you're going to get more eyeballs if you can just sign the biggest stars out there. Saudi Arabia's public investment fund is shifting its allocations to focus more on domestic projects. And normally we don't report on the strategies of sovereign wealth funds here, but the PIF happens to be arguably the single largest investor in sports properties in the world. It owns Premier League club Newcastle United, it funds Live Golf, it has major investments in the world of tennis, and the country will host the 2034 World Cup and the 2029 Asian Winter Games at a mountain resort that is still under construction. Some of those could be considered domestic or international investments, and that accounting may have some very tangible effects on the sports world because the PIF has around $930 billion in assets. Either way, there will still be plenty of money for them to throw into sports, and of course their international investments touch many sectors of the economy, but even a reallocation of a few percentage points could redirect around $25 billion. To the NFL, the Indianapolis Colts are benching quarterback Anthony Richardson in favor of 39-year-old backup Joe Flacco. Richardson has struggled this year after having his rookie season cut short by injury. He also took himself out of Sunday's game for one play because he was tired. That's very relatable to me, but the Colts weren't pleased. There's arguably a trend here. Bryce Young, last year's top draft pick, was benched earlier this year. Will Levis, who was also in that draft class, was in danger of being benched before he was injured. Other recent high draft pick QBs, such as Trey Lance, Justin Fields, and Mac Jones, are all without a starting job. At the same time, there are plenty of counterexamples. Jaden Daniels, CJ Stroud, Brock Purdy, and Bo Nix are some of the league's biggest stars, and they are all still on rookie deals, which means they are some of the most valuable players in the NFL because their teams can spend more on other positions. Drafting a quarterback is still an inexact science, but when you get it right, suddenly you're a contender. When you get it wrong, you're kind of a mess for a while, but the reward side of that risk-reward equation is big enough that teams are going to keep giving highly touted draft picks starting jobs and hoping that it works. Over to one of the players that the 49ers spent on after saving a lot of money on Brock Purdy, Nick Bosa has taken to popping up in the background of interviews with his teammates wearing a MAGA hat and pointing to the hat. The election is in a few days and a lot of feelings are coming out. I've seen Sun compare what Bosa is doing to the actions of a former 49er, Colin Kaepernick, who started a national conversation about sports and politics by kneeling during the national anthem. Bosa has not started a national conversation, neither has Chiefs kicker Harrison Butker, who started a political action committee, or Steve Kerr, who spoke at the Democratic National Convention. We've gone from telling athletes to stick to sports to mostly just tuning it out if they're saying something we don't want to hear. Sports is one of the great unifiers across the political spectrum, and when Kaepernick was kneeling, people felt like he was denying them their ability to tune out the rest of the world and watch some football. Now it's all just kind of a blur. I'm sure at some point, some athlete will do something that pierces through all of this and makes us have a new kind of conversation about this, but I don't know what that will be, because the lines we weren't supposed to cross just 10 years ago have mostly vanished. Speaking of which, my colleagues Margaret Fleming and Alex Schiffer spent weeks researching the political donations of sports team owners. They dug up a lot, and they joined us next to discuss their findings. I'm joined now by front office sports reporters, Margaret Fleming and Alex Schiffer. Welcome, Margaret. Welcome, Alex. Hey, Owen. What's up, Owen? So the two of you spent weeks researching the political donations of sports team owners and some other um, figures in the sports world. Um, lots to get to. Everyone should check out your, your piece because there's more in there than we can get to in this segment. But let's start where you guys start in the piece with the biggest donor in sports and one of the biggest donors in 
America. And that is the relatively new Dallas Mavericks owner, Miriam Adelson. Uh, Alex, talk to us about what Adelson is contributing to the uh, political sphere here. Yeah, I mean, she's given $100 million essentially to have Donald Trump reelected. She said she was going to do it earlier in the year. And uh, she literally put her money where her mouth is and gave nine figures to uh, to his campaign and its efforts. You know, obviously you can't donate that much in uh, one swing to that, but just throughout all of her uh, her efforts in various places to put it. And uh, it is by far the highest amount of any American sports owner that we found. And no one else can really touch. She's in an atmosphere all by herself. Yeah, one thing I found striking is that if you count um, that hundred million plus her congressional donations, and this is all to political action committees, of course, you can only give like you know I think thirty three hundred to um, to individual campaigns. PACs kind of you know let you do whatever you want after that. Anyway, um, she's actually given more to Republican causes to Republican candidates than Elon Musk, who's you know received all sorts of coverage throughout this election cycle. Uh, she has quietly done, you know, almost as much for Trump and um, more more for Republicans total. Uh, the other biggie, uh, Margaret, is Ken Griffin, who is, you know, a, a backer of U.S. soccer. He's one of the people that brought Mauricio Pochettino uh, to be head coach of the national team. Uh, he's also a, almost as, as big donor to Republican causes. Yeah, yeah. He's given more than $100 million to Republican causes. And um, that's just a lot. He hasn't come out and endorsed Trump. He said he thinks that he will win. But that's been an interesting thing that, I mean, definitely came up in our research was that a lot of these really big donors um, would give to causes on one side, but weren't necessarily giving to the candidate or endorsing the candidate. Um, and he was one of them. But he's a huge figure in U.S. soccer um, and just a huge donor across the board in all different kinds of industries, but has leaned really red for this election. Yeah, and that does seem to be a pattern among uh, many of the biggest donors is, yeah, often spreading their money around to various PACs, um, usually on the GOP side. Another one, Margaret, is um, the minority owners of the Bears, Pat and Shirley Ryan. Yeah, yeah, they're huge Northwestern donors. Basically everything at my alma mater is named um, for the Ryans, and they were also on that Washington Post list um, of kind of top 50 donors, um, and they were leaning Republican as well. Who, who are some of the other names that, that popped out to you guys? I mean, there's there's so many to get to, but we, we should just hit, hit a few of the top ones. Um, yeah, who, who else kind of stands out in, in this picture? Yeah, I'd say for NBA, uh, the DeVos family, who owns the Orlando Magic, they gave about $12 million as a family to various Republican causes. Uh, Tim Fertitta, the Rockets owner, also had his money spread around a lot. I remember he had like a 400 K plus donation to a Trump pack, but also to a bunch of different Republican causes. Uh, Mickey Arison of the Heat to me is a very interesting donor because a lot of, you know, he donated to a bunch of politicians kind of across the country, whether it be in California or um, Idaho and, you know, random states like that where you're like, why does the Miami Heat owner care? But then you look and some of those politicians are on the Senate subcommittee and House subcommittees for like transportation. Mickey Harrison's fortune comes from the Carnival Cruise Line. So his, he's very strategic in, you know, backing the pockets of people who can affect his industry the most. I think you saw some of that, depending upon where you looked. Um, Dana White for UFC gave, I think, 10K to every Republican, uh, par, uh, every GOP party, every GOP, uh, state GOP. Um, so Hawaii Republican Party, New Jersey Republican Party, et cetera. Sorry that took so long. Uh, so I'd say he was an interesting one. Um, Adam Silver had a couple of donations. I'm pretty sure he was the only commissioner of the major sports to donate. I mean, Dana White's obviously UFC's kind of commissioner, but uh, he had a handful to Hakeem Jeffries, to the uh, North Carolina Democratic Party. Um, he had a donation, I believe, for Kamala Harris. So uh, that's another interesting one, just because most of the commissioners didn't really touch that stuff. Yeah, and Silver, you know, is an interesting case. There's a few kind of... Um both sides situations here of uh, silver and you know many of his the owners in the nba um are, are one of those you know obviously um uh adelson and fertita are you know making major donations to the gop while their commissioner is donating to the democrats uh, and there's also some families um and ownership groups where we see some donations on both sides 
the Bucks, who also own Manchester United, the Glazer family. Avram has given over $3 million to Democrats. Um, his brother Edward has given nearly a million dollars to Republicans. You see that with the Ricketts family, with the Cubs, um, with the brothers giving heavily to Republicans and um, the sister Laura giving uh, pretty generously over a million dollars to Democrats. Um, so just kind of interesting. And then it's outside of families even and just like ownership groups. You see it with uh, the Mavs, with um, Adelson um, giving so much to Trump and then Mark Cuban being such a big backer of Kamala Harris, not exactly giving to her. He said he hasn't given her any money, but he's seemed pretty bullish on the campaign um, or about the campaign. So, um, yeah, it's within these groups, within these families. Um, they're kind of canceling each other out a little bit or just hedging their bets regardless. But, um, yeah, you're seeing different political sides and a lot of spending going on there. Zooming out, I mean, you guys have spent weeks sifting through this data. I'm wondering if you kind of come away with any overall picture or if it's all just a bunch of isolated data points that don't really cohere into anything. I would say, I guess, and again, obviously we haven't, we didn't look at, you know, historical data of like all the past elections and whatnot, but just off of this one, I feel like the most donations, not from a money perspective, but just from a individual campaign perspective, I think that just most of the owners donated toward House and Senate races more so than presidential races. Like I think those, like I mentioned for Tita, we talked about the Adelsons, uh, those who donated to the presidential campaigns gave significant money. Most of them, there were a handful of, you know, the 3300s to Kamala or, or Donald Trump. But I feel like those that really like uh, had their money spread out around a bunch of different campaigns or, or between the House and Senate, you know, it was mostly there and not really a lot toward the presidential race. And I'd be interested to kind of see how that stacks up with these people historically. You know, was this the election that they kind of tapped out and said, I'm sitting this one out? Um, is this historically how they've always donated? I think that that's probably, if you just kind of look at our Excel sheet, the, uh, the thickest and, and the most action with a lot of people is in the house and Senate and the president, it real the presidential race is very much a random. There's more randomness, I say to it of, of who donated and who didn't, where there's, where way more, I'd say X out of 10 owners donated toward House and Senate races more so than X out of 10 donated to the presidential campaigns, which I think is an interesting correlation, given that as a nation, all we've talked about is the, the presidential race, whereas the smaller ones haven't really gotten much attention outside of the local level. Kind of going off of that, I feel like I've been really surprised with how many people have given to really key Senate races, specifically um, in Ohio um, with Marino versus Brown and then in mm -hmm. Pennsylvania. Um, Oh, gosh, I'm forgetting it. Sorry. Uh, you're going to have to. Yeah, Casey and McCormick. Sorry, Daniel. You know, and, and in Pennsylvania with Casey and McCormick, um, just seeing like people like Robert Kraft come in and like really supporting someone like McCormick, um, giving like $50,000 to that um, effort there. Um, and that's not like his home state. He didn't really do like a ton of spending elsewhere. And so um, you're kind of seeing people get really involved strategically. And, and those two seats specifically, I mean, there's a lot I could say about both of them, but those are going to be really key for like control of the Senate. Um, and it's both Democratic incumbents and Republican challengers um, and, and pretty strong Republican challengers. So it's really interesting to see owners who are kind of really investing in that or to see like, you know, the gridiron pack or the MLB commissioners pack, like which side of those arguments are they supporting or, or that, you know, that race. So um, I've been really interested to see like, how people are getting involved in, yeah, like Alex said, it's it's about a little bit more than Donald Trump and Kamala Harris, like where they're giving their money in places that could actually have a really big impact. And if I can piggyback off of Margaret real quick, you know, we're in the middle of the World Series right now where um, they, the Yankees and Dodgers have the two highest payrolls in baseball, but neither of their owners really donate to anything uh, in our findings. So it's also interesting just seeing like the Cincinnati Reds, the San Francisco Giants, like their owners are two of the biggest in the MLB who donated to various races. We mentioned the DeVoe family who own the Orlando Magic. Um, it's just interesting, too, that the correlation between like the spending that the families did versus the reputation their teams have for spending. You know, we're talking about a lot of small market teams that aren't really known for lending marquee free agents or handing out these gigantic contracts. And uh but, you know, if you do some of the math on what these owners donated for some of that own some of these smaller market teams, not that we're talking like a Shohei Otani contract number outside of like me and Allison, but um, it is just interesting that, you know, the, the stigma of like these teams don't really spend for their free agents or take care of their players 
Um, or uh, that doesn't really translate to politics, I guess, is what there's definitely some correlation there. Alex Schiffer, Margaret Fleming, great work on the piece. And thank you for joining us on the show. Thank you, Owen. Thank you. Up next, I spoke with Dan Titus on the changing face of the NBA, the parody in the league, and how sports betting has changed fantasy basketball. He also has a pretty interesting career arc. We discussed all of that, and that's coming up next. I'm joined now by Yahoo Sports NBA expert and fantasy basketball analyst, Dan Titus. Welcome, Dan. Hey, Owen. Nice to meet you, man. Thanks for having me on. Yeah, yeah. Great to have you on. Um, so actually, first, I want to just learn a li- little bit about you. You got your start, as many basketball writers do, in the aerospace industry. Um, what were you doing, and how did you end up you know, th- eventually switching to writing about basketball? Yeah, so I started out my career, um, graduated from Virginia Tech in a recession, so I had to find a job. So I wound up working for Lockheed Martin for uh, 11 years, and it was a really good run. I was a project manager for uh, commercial satellite and missile defense programs, um, did everything from a closed area to, you know, doing high end production uh, support. So it was a it was a good ride, man. But like, I just found myself more often than not going to my car and sur- surfing the waiver wires for the latest ad or reacting to some injury news. And I, I had this aha moment one day driving back. I'm, I live in the Bay Area and commuting's awful. And I was just thinking to myself, like, I can't keep doing this. And It just so happens I reached out to a fancy analyst um, in the industry. They met up for coffee and they're like, hey, you should go to this event and learn more about it. I was like, "Okay, cool. So I did that. And next thing I know, that just spiraled into my interest in, hey, I think I really want to write about fantasy sports. And that's kind of how I got started in the industry. I've been playing fantasy sports for over 20 years. I've been with I've been playing on Yahoo for 20 years, too. So just it was a full circle moment for me to come back and actually be able to create content for a company that I've admired for so long. So been a really fun and unique journey, had some entrepreneurship opportunities in between there. Um, But ultimately, it led me back to, uh, you know, being a full time content creator. So couldn't be happier. Yeah, very cool. And and yeah, very much sympathize with the Bay Area traffic thing. I've had to deal with that (laughs) a couple points in my life. Looking broadly at this NBA season, what's stood out to you so far? So for me, it's it's just really been the the Lakers. Like I, I think, in if you're watching as a casual fan, you know, obviously there's a lot of fandom around the Dallas Cowboys and football. They're terrible. Whereas like when the Lakers are good, basketball is better. Um, so I think JJ Reddick's really uh, instituted this newfound enthusiasm around the Lakers. And when the business of basketball is good, is when their stars are at its peak. And I think one thing that's been great is that LeBron James has been the face of this league for you know upwards of 20 years now and it seems like he's the oldest man on the court and yet he's still playing more than some of the younger superstars so I think you know initially as I'm looking at some of the NBA ratings and viewership numbers the numbers are a little bit down to begin the season because there's a lot of star players that are missing the games but hey as long as LeBron James is still out there I think we're in good hands um But yeah, I think that this is a a really pivotal point in the NBA's landscape because I think this could be an opportunity to see a changing of the guard. We could be seeing a new face of the NBA coming up very soon. We don't know how much longer LeBron James can defy father time. Stephen Curry's getting older. Kevin Durant's getting up there in age. This could be the time where we start seeing that pendulum swing of Anthony Edwards, John Morant, Tyrese Maxey, all these younger players kind of coming up into their own and and possibly getting more shine as superstars um, in this league. Yeah, actually, I wanted to get into that kind of face of the league franchise just quickly on the Lakers. It does. I mean, it's only been a few games, who knows, but it just kind of makes me a little bit think of that Warriors season where, um, what was it? 21, 22, when they won the championship again, where it felt like, no, like they're still the team that like had that dynasty. And like, some ha- like some years that can just like you know all come together again. I don't know if the Lakers are going to do that, but I think they're reminding us that like yeah they they won a championship not that long ago. Like maybe they could make this work. Uh, obviously, a lot of competition out in the West. Yeah. Um, on that face of the league thing, yeah, I was thinking about this too. Where yeah, I mean, I think it's still LeBron, Steph is still around, Durant is still still really good, but. Not only do you have like a good like young group like the guys you mentioned like Ant Maxi I throw in Wemby there too, um, but you've got this like middle tier as well. I mean, just like middle tier in age with like Luca, yeah. uh, Jokic, Giannis. SGA. Mm-hmm. Yeah, they're going to be around for a, a, a while, and they're still superstars. They're still you know 
people that could be the the big star on a championship team. I feel like the NBA is in a really good place in terms of just having a diverse group of really good players who like fans can get behind and be really excited that like this is the guy on your team. That's that's exactly right. And I think it just speaks to the NBA's ability to just become a global business. Um, you know, we're seeing superstars internationally from Giannis Antetokounmpo, Luka Doncic. I mean, Nikola Jokic has been a three-time MVP, and he may not be one of the most popular players in the league, but I think when you're watching the game and just to get an appreciation of this game and how much is it's evolved over time, um, I think the league is just in a really good hands right now. And, you know, I think part of that might actually play into – the way that the new CBA has been structured to offer more parity. So it's giving these smaller market teams, bigger opportunities to be able to showcase and actually retain certain talent, you know, cause who would have thought that Giannis Antetokounmpo would still be with the bucks after winning a championship. I mean, that's a pretty small market team. Yeah. He was kind of flirting with like, maybe I'm going to go to New he's York. Still, maybe, you know, yeah. he's, there was a couple of years. He's still kind so. of floating it too. Um, uh, passive aggressively. But, you know, when you mentioned Victor Webb and Yama, you know, if the Spurs can be able to rate, retain him, I mean, talk about an ideal landing spot, him going to the, the Spurs, potentially being under the tutelage of, of Greg Popovich for the beginning part of his career. Um, we could be seeing these these smaller market teams actually emerge as legitimate, you know, championship type teams. And I think that the new CBA kind of helped that um, kind of usher that in and, and actually have some staying power here for at least the next seven years. One, I think the parody is really good. And I, I'm wondering if this is about like the peak, like peak parity that we can achieve and maybe that we want to achieve. Like you want there to be some level of sustainable success. Like it's not just like random every year. Yeah. Um, I do, do you think it like this is about as good as it can get parity wise? I mean, we've had six different champions in six years. Um, I think that we saw when the player empowerment movement was at its strongest, NBA stars were just deciding where they wanted to go. And the league was like, we can't, we can't continue to have this because there was just so much of an overwhelming dominance by certain teams. Like we watched the the dynasty of the Warriors, you know, with Kevin Durant coming here and and then before that the Miami Heat for a short amount of time. So I think that it was a crucial element that needed to happen. And I think it's better for basketball and better also for viewership because how often are teams going are casual fans going to just tune into, you know, a random Tuesday game when they know that these teams realistically don't really have a chance to really amount to anything more than like a playoff contending team. I think it just opened up way more opportunity for the, the whole league at large to not only be more profitable, but also to be a more entertaining viewing experience by having so much more parity. Would Do you point to anything in particular um, in terms of like players having less of a say over where they go? I mean, I'm thinking of Dame Lillard, especially because he said when he was leaving the Blazers or like when, you know, everyone knew he was going to leave the Blazers. Yeah. He said he was, but he was still under contract with them. They still got to decide where to trade him to. He said, I, I want to go to the heat. Like that was a public <laughs> thing. Um, and we've seen a lot of players do that where they're like, here's the, my one team or my three teams where I say it's okay for you to trade me. And we've seen a lot of those players go to that team. Lillard obviously went to the Bucks and, um, you know, I think James Harden's another example of a guy who like tried to control his fate. Ben Simmons a while back. Um, did something happen that made it so players didn't get to always just like pick their spots? Uh, I think now, uh, you know, I think that teams are just being more cognizant of the financial implications of taking on, you know, certain salaries. You know, I think right now superstars going to their anticipated or their most, you know, coveted locations is really predicated on what their contract looks like. Brandon Ingram has not gotten a contract extension yet. Um, and that's because other teams are looking like, how can we fit him into our cap situation, knowing that we have to pay him that much more money? I think it's really going to hamstring teams from really stockpiling these all-star caliber players that are in their primes. This is really about to be about a, a, a lesson in mathematics and financial stability because you're going to have to figure out which superstars are going to want to take a discount like the New York Knicks and Jalen Brunson taking such a significant discount in his max deal to be able to allow other players to come in like Carl Anthony Towns. Um, it's going to be a actually very selfless opportunity for stars if they really want to team up with certain teams. But there's also going to be those players that are financially motivated. They're like, hey, I don't really care. I'm just going to go get, you know, my max deal like Paul George. Like, you know, he could have taking a shorter deal with the Los Angeles Clippers, but it's like, Hey, I'm just going to get this four years maxed out with the Sixers. I'll play it out as it goes. So 
I think that there's going to be less interest in players actually holding leverage now, now that the the CBA is just so strict and that luxury tax and that second apron is going to be such a, a hallmark for fan, for um, organizations going forward. I want to hop over to um, uh, the fantasy world, uh, like not not who I should like have on my team or anything, but um, obviously, like you know, you've been been in that world for you said twenty years um, professionally for some of that. At some point, sports betting became legal, and um, you know that's you know now there's like ads everywhere you can possibly look for for that. Um, has that kind of like taken over some part of the fantasy world or is fantasy still kind of siloed off? I think that they're actually playing pretty well in unison with each other. I think, you know, a foray to sports betting was fantasy sports. And I think we're seeing a lot of innovation within the fantasy community, just in, you know, the, the, the different options, you know, from free to play to peer to peer to, um, you know, daily fantasy sports and even season long uh, best ball has become very popular um, with a lot of uh, different uh, software companies for fantasy sports. And I think we're just going to continue to see a, a general evolution of, of this game. And, and sports betting, I think, is just the next, that next tier to it. Um, I think that there's a, 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 a path where they're both going to be very successful. And I think you can see right now the monetization on the betting side is, is definitely um, rising. Uh, but, but I think that there is also some uh, – there are some risks to that as well because – you know, the, a lot of this is just marketing spend. So I'm curious to how the sports books, there's so many options out there, if there's going to be some consolidation over time. Um, but right now it's just, a, it's a, it's an open market. So I think everyone's pretty much just trying to hit the ground running and, and get as much exposure as possible. And I think the more sports betting becomes popular, the more sustainability we'll have in fantasy sports because they just go hand in hand. The data is the same. Um, a lot of the prop betting markets that have, have increased and grown is really just fantasy sports, just <laughs> different ones dealing with actual money and the other ones uh, just uh, going to fantasy points. But I think there's a lot of correlation there. Um, so I think that these, both of these industries will kind of um, piggyback and support each other. Yeah, that makes sense. And have you seen any change in, you know, your readership or the types of questions you get or anything like that, um, you know, in the last few years? Um, I, I would say recently, um, you know, Yahoo Sports is, is the premier spot for for fantasy sports. And I think they've done a great job of of offering several different games as well as um, information on sports betting. So, you know, with the new Yahoo Sports app, you know, you have the ability to look at the games, the scores, then also go to your fantasy team and see what you're doing. So having that one-stop shop, I think it's just been great for not only our, you know, engagement with fans because they could be spewing out, you know, whatever gripes they have for, oh, this guy didn't, you know, hit on my fantasy team, but also I lost my prop bet. Um, so I think it kind of just goes hand in hand. So it's it's nice to see um, our user base and, and, and audience responding well to, not only the change in, you know, sports spending becoming legal across more states, but then also, you know, still act actively involved in the game, which we've seen in fantasy basketball, specifically um, rising numbers, historic numbers that we haven't seen. So it's really exciting. Uh, before I let you go, uh, who's winning the NBA finals and who are they beating? Oh, it's the most chalky, boring recommendation. And <laughs> but it's got to be the Boston Celtics, man. Like, I just don't see um, a team that's going to be as complete and deep as they are. Um they're battle tested now. And for whatever reason, people wanted to hate on Jason Tatum as if you need any more motivation to, to be that dude. Um, and it's clear he's, 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 he's heard you and uh, they're responding pretty well. So I think they're going to run it back. Oh, uh -huh, cool. And who, who comes out of the West? Ooh, I think it's going to be the Dallas Mavericks again. I think we're going to have a, I think we're going to have a repeat of the NBA championship here. I, I think that the, or, the Oklahoma city thunder are really exciting. I just don't think that they have the experience that Luca Kyrie Irving and now, you know, retooled with, with clay Thompson there. I think they just have a ton of NBA playoff experience. That I think is going to win out uh, when it's all said and done. Clay, his last year with the warriors <laughs> uh, kind of made you forget like how good that guy can be. That's but, right. Like, yeah. you know, playoff clay is, is a beast. Um, yeah, uh, I'll leave it there. Dan Titus, <laughs> thank you so much for joining us on the show. Thanks a lot, Owen. Time now for Front Office Sports Tomorrow, where we look ahead to what's coming in the business of sports. A new women's sports league is coming. The Women's Pro Baseball League plans to launch in the summer of 2026. Like the Professional Women's Hockey League, it will start with six teams. They will be based mostly in the Northeastern U.S. 
The league is being co-founded by Keith Stein, a lawyer and businessman, and Justine Siegel, who founded Baseball for All, a nonprofit focused on creating pathways for girls into baseball. The success of the WNBA and WSL and the encouraging start of the PWHL has shown that there's an appetite and a market for more women's sports. The Women's Pro Baseball League will seek a national broadcast deal. That's it for today. Leave us a rating and review wherever you like to tune in. If you're on YouTube, throw us a like and subscribe. Thanks for listening. We will see you tomorrow.